This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include Chris Fitzsimon from NC Policy Watch, former Secretary of State, former Attorney General Rufus Edmonston, current Becky Gray with the John Locke Foundation, and John Hood, chairman of the John Locke Foundation and syndicated uh, columnist. Well, this week we're going to welcome two new <coughs> affiliate stations to the NC Spin Network, WCCB CW18 in Charlotte and WXLV ABC45 in the Greensboro Winston-Salem High Point Market. Welcome to all of you. We've got a good show for you, starting with the questions raised over UNC Chapel Hill's accreditation. We'll examine whether school officials were caught in double speak or just lowering the bar on reading tests. And we'll talk about the court case following the elimination of teacher tenure. Should be a good show, so let's get started. Fallout from the UNC athletic scandal continues to plague the school. The Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, the organization that provides accrediting to higher education, has called into question 18 standards, they say, threaten the integrity of the university. Perhaps the biggest charge is that UNC was not diligent in the initial investigation and did not know or did not share with them the extent of academic problems. UNC responded to the charging saying they weren't fully informed because the two people largely responsible for the academic fraud didn't cooperate with them. But the Wayne Strain report showed that there were others aware of and concerned about these paper classes. Rufus, a lot of people have said UNC's not been transparent throughout this whole process and that they're continuing that course of action and responding to the Southern Association. What's your read? Well, as you know, and this panel knows, I've been very critical of my alma mater in the past, and I think they deserved it. I think they have not been transparent in the past, but I want to tell you, I think they get it now. Uh, when they sent their first report in, they did not have the benefit of the two cheaters, the chief cheaters, I call them. Uh, then uh, the district attorney made things happen. He said, if you don't talk, you two, then you're going to have bad things happen to you. And they started talking. And then I think, I think the administration has finally got it that you need to be transparent. I think they've apologized over and over again. I think they're truly sorry. I think we have a very good chancellor who does not want to leave her legacy as a broken Carolina. And I think they're going to get this thing over with and finally get back to being one of the greatest universities in the country. Becky, the, the, the two people, as Rufus said, who were sort of instrumental in this whole thing, um, as I remember it, were granted immunity, finally, by the district Correct. attorney, uh, which allowed them to begin speaking. Does that justify what UNC has been saying, that they didn't know about this because the two people largely responsible weren't weren't talking? I, I find that very difficult to believe. This has been going on for 18 years. Over 3,000 students have been taking these fake classes, if you will. There have been professors that have been involved in this. I mean, this is not just an academic scandal. This is an, uh, or an athletic scandal. This is an academic scandal as well. You know, it's like the worst kept secret in the world. So, no, I mean, I'm not buying any of this. Of, you know, two people wouldn't talk, so we didn't know what was going on. Well, that's kind of the smoking gun, isn't it, John? The fact that there were so many people that were aware of this. Uh, I, I guess the, the big question, though, is why didn't any of these people come forward? Well, I think that there are two dynamics. One of them everybody talks about, and we've already mentioned it, which is sports. Naturally, there was a, uh, well, naturally is unfortunate, but it is true, there was a natural tendency to look the other way to try to win basketball games and or football games, though the latter is somewhat rarer. Uh, so that was number one. But truthfully, Tom, it is important to note all the non-athletes that took these fake True. classes. And I'm absolutely convinced that if these fake classes had been tried out in some other department, they would have been more quickly identified and done something about it. I think Afro and Afro-American and African studies was somewhat ignored or given a pass or people were afraid to touch it because of the racial dynamic of the discussion. All right, so Chris, what are some of the possible scenarios here from the Southern Association? Obviously, they could lose accreditation mm -hmm. or they could get 
a, a little slap on the wrist. What are some other well, scenarios? Well, or, or I suppose they could require UNC to do certain things to make sure they keep their accreditation. Um, you know, the, I, I'm sort of of two minds on this. I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I think that UNC clearly was not uh, transparent for a long time. I do think the Martin report, I think the former governor did the best job he could, but he ran into a roadblock because these people didn't have to talk and they were the key linchpins to uncover everything else. Uh, but I also don't know of a university from Auburn to NC State, even back in the 80s with Jim Valvano, nobody has ever hired a former Homeland Security official to do the sort of report that they finally did. Now, I'll grant you it was too late, uh, but I think they did do a thorough report and they laid it all out there. They made everybody available, everybody cooperated, and that's why we keep talking about all the things that we found out. That's the way we found it out is that UNC finally put it all in one place. News Observer certainly did a lot of the legwork to start it. But at some point, I think that cooler heads prevailed. Chancellor Fulton and Tom Ross and others said, okay, we want that we told Weinstein, you do everything you need to do. Everybody will cooperate with you. Let's finally get it all so out. What happens, it was too late. What happens if they lose accreditation? My understanding is they could lose fe millions of dollars in federal research grants and other federal funding. There are different levels of, of, of penalties what's they the can, they what's can the do. What's the impact of all that, and, though? I mean, as I, what I've said, Tom, this is a lot shut more... shut down the university? It's a lot more serious than taking down somebody's jersey because you thought a, a game was rigged or something. And uh, they're taking it very seriously. And one thing they're working on very hard is the admission standards, which I think is the most important. If you can't graduate, you don't get in. And the accreditation, I think, is just part of the problem. You know, the NCAA is looking at this, too. So I think there's a whole other area that, that there are really action, serious problems yeah, there. There's a know. class action lawsuit, which, by the way, we're going to be talking about next week on the show. Don't forget you can get more video content from our website, ncspin.com. You can read and see these NCSpin perspectives only at ncspin.com or ncspin on Facebook. And we're tweeting at ncspin tweets. Balance debate for the old North State. When we come back, we're going to ask the question, is it academic doublespeak or just lowering the bar? NC Spin will return after these messages. Phones are getting smarter, cars more efficient, TVs bigger and more stunning. Imagine the same innovation from agriculture. Meet the Plant Sciences Initiative at NC State, a proposed state-of-the-art research complex where world-class researchers will tackle agriculture's toughest challenges, like feeding the world's rapidly growing population while preserving natural resources for future generations. Join Farm Bureau and NC State in moving North Carolina to the forefront of ag research in the world. Visit keepaggrowing.org. Every year, North Carolina patients undergo 635,000 same-day surgeries. 72% of these surgeries are performed in our highest-cost hospital facilities, adding as much as $2,000 to every procedure. The state's outdated Certificate of Need law prevents competition from lower-cost, higher-quality same-day surgery centers, inflating health care costs, and limiting patient choice. Tell state lawmakers it's time to lower health care costs now. It's time to make a simple fix to an outdated law, increasing patient choice and lowering health care costs now. You can help. Visit reformconnow.com and tell lawmakers it's time for a simple fix to an outdated law. It's time to lower health care costs now. How will North Carolina compete in a future where everything is accelerated? Join state leaders February 9th and 10th at the Raleigh Convention Center for the 30th Annual Emerging Issues Forum. Explore how innovators are thriving and how North Carolina can keep pace. Register now at emergingissues.org. CCANC is an organization that really tries to help everybody enjoy their moments fishing. They try to help create awareness. They also work on trying to protect our resources so that it'll be there for our children as well. I think another consistent theme that we all have is we want to leave the resource in better shape than we found it. You know, CCA do so many different things, be it a habitat project, restoring oysters, maybe working for good conservation and good management, going fishing and sharing a passion for a healthy resource. There's plenty of fish for everybody. There's fish for commercial guys, there's fish for recreational guys. If it's managed in an effective and scientific way. We have that world record style fishery here, but we've got to make science-based management the future of our fisheries management policies, and then we'll be moving forward, and our legislature needs to know that.
Become a member today at ccanc.org slash join. We now return to NC Spin. North Carolina's Read to Achieve law was passed to ensure that students could read at a third grade level before being promoted to the fourth grade. In the first year that more rigorous common core standards were used in the testing process, only 45% of the third graders passed. Thousands of students faced having to go to summer school in what Judge Howdy Manning called academic doublespeak. DPI expanded the scoring categories from four to five and ruled that those in three of the categories had passed instead of the only two categories previously. <coughs> In a hearing before Judge Manning last week, DPI tried to explain their reasoning. Becky, Judge Manning said he understood why DPI made this change. Do you? And can you help us understand it? Because it seems to me it just, they just lowered the bar so it would appear that uh, it wasn't quite so bad. Are we missing something? I, I think you've explained it quite well, and I think Judge Manning, when he said that this was double speak, also explained it pretty well. I think he understands what it is. It's double speak. And the, Tom, what I think we have here really is a, different of, a difference of intent. The General Assembly, when they passed Read to Achieve, the intent was that every third grader in North Carolina would know how to read before they went to the fourth grade. The intent of DPI seems to be to change the parameters of the criteria of determining that in order to qualify more children for being able to read when in fact the what the test tells us is 55 percent of the third graders can't read now what's left in the balance between those two intents are third graders across North Carolina that as Judge Manning is trying to figure this out while DPI is making excuses for this while the General Assembly continues to try to clarify what their intent is and that is to ensure that third graders can read we have third graders sitting in classrooms today who are being left behind who are being set up to not be able to take advantage well, okay, of opportunities. Let's look at the practicality of this though, Rufus. 45% uh, of the third graders passed. That means 55% didn't pass. Now all of a sudden educators are looking at thousands and thousands of students who, according to the law, are going to have to go to summer school. That was just going to uh, deluge the system practically it just couldn't work, could it? I don't know why we don't have year-round schools anyway. We should have a long time ago. The, the farm population is no longer out there. Uh, I, I still sort of disagree with my friend over here. Uh, I taught the third grade one time, but these were not normal people. They were in a little private school. Uh, you ever think about how much a, a child gets stigmatized? and you, You've got this little area there that you go from the third to the fourth. You make the, the kid stay in the third grade. You don't know what, what his background was. Uh, so much of a kid's learning ability is, is developed bec because or lack of parental care. And I don't think this measures it. We're testing again. Uh, I, I would go with DPI on this, Becky. I, 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 well, wait a minute, yeah. John. I, it, let's look at it from a, flip it over from another point of view. Okay, so we changed it from 45% who passed to 60% who passed. Whoa, 40% still we're not passing. Absolutely. Uh, that's here's, here's what that's happened. unacceptable. That's here's, here's what happened. We had this standard. We have these four, well, four levels, one, two, three, four. You were supposedly passing at three or four. The problem that DPI pointed out is that the statistical difference between a high two and three was not significant. So that was, the, that was the, the, the justification for the fifth level and why Judge Manning said initially this is ridiculous and then said, okay, maybe I understand. The, they're all having the wrong discussion, however. Instead of focusing on the kids who were almost at level three, we should really focus our scarce resources, and resources are always scarce, even if you increase funding 50%, yeah. you still have scarce resources. We should have been focusing on the kids who were testing at level one because they are the biggest pro they have the biggest challenges, the most likely to drop out later because they're falling behind. And I think a better set of educational triage standards would have would have uh, headed this. Well, Chris, I mean, okay, off. so so uh, Judge Manning says, uh, and Howdy's pretty plain spoken. It's not hard mm -hmm. to understand what tri Howdy's trying to say. He says he's still going to just use those top two tiers. Uh, to get, are, are we going to see some more action from him as a result of this? Well, I don't know. It's a good question. And to see what if the General Assembly changes the Read to Achieve program. I, John's right, uh, actually, on this, surprisingly. Uh, the, the kids that we should be focusing on are the kids who score at a one. You know, the, the, the legislation that Senator Berger passed in the General Assembly in the last session 
uh, had summer school, had a reading camp, and some of the data from that isn't as promising as we thought. It also is true, as Rufus has said, if you have a kid who's on the borderline or not doing quite as well and you fail that kid or you hold them back, the odds are they are gonna, they're more likely to drop out later in school. So what we need to do is get them early with diagnostic tests, figure out the extra help they need in the first, second, and third grade before they have to take the test. It's the only way to do it, but you can't flunk 60 or 50 percent of the kids. Yeah, well, okay, but I mean, I think we should be less worried about their emotional well-being here than we well, they are drop, about their... Well, it's not their... emotional well-being, Tom. They're more likely to drop out of school and go to prison. Well, so, okay. I mean, that, that, yeah. If that, they can't the read, point. they are, for sure. Right, and if they, you put them in the next class and, the, and, I mean, you keep them behind and they're not motivated and they're more stigmatized, there's, the, there, there's a lot of actually data and science about this that holding kids back, unless in specific cases, does more harm than good. We have to figure out how to help them, not just hold them back. I'm the doubting Thomas on that one. When we come back after these messages, we're going to look at teacher tenure and the courts. NC Spin will return after these messages. The best part about being a member of a Touchstone Energy Cooperative is that it's your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. Learn more about the power of your co-op membership at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives, looking out for you. Medicaid system is not a perfect system. Uh, there are things that could be changed, but we, there's a lot that's going well with the system. Our Community Care of North Carolina is in place. It's a team of nurses, advisors, uh, caregivers who help us out. We want to call and, and say, look, I've got Miss so-and-so here. She needs to have her weight checked each day because she's got congestive heart failure. Can you send one of those monitors out to the house and keep an eye on this and let me know if her weight goes up too much because if it does, she's retaining fluid and she's going to be back in the hospital. We work together with them. That's a great system. It saves a lot of money. It's proven to work. We're not opposed to changing the things that need to be changed, but let's not throw out everything that we worked for for the past 15 to 20 years. North Carolina's Family Physicians supports Medicaid reform that builds on our state's foundation of medical homes. OurNCHealthcare.com Where do you go when you need to know? ANC makes it easy for you to get the information you need to make well-informed public policy decisions. Our members are industry leaders who are ready to share their industry-specific insights with you. Want to hear both sides of the story? ANC members can tell you. Just use the ANC member directory as your guide or call us directly. ANC members have the knowledge, expertise, and perspective you need to create public policies that are good for North Carolina. We are ready for your call. Does your North Carolina business or organization have a story to tell? I'm Richard Campbell, and at Carolina Broadcasting and Publishing, we help tell stories that connect you to the people who will respond. We take the time to understand our clients' needs and what makes them unique. We craft their stories through the efficient use of words, images, and videos that resonate with their desired audience. We also know that a good story is incomplete without a call to action. On video, on air, online, and in print, from concept to final production, no one can help tell your story more effectively or affordably than we can. For special introductory offers, visit carolinabroadcasting.com or call 919-832-1416. Again, that's carolinabroadcasting.com. Let us help tell your story today. We now return to NC Spin. A three-judge court of appeals panel is deciding whether or not the legislature violated the rights of teachers when they ended teacher tenure or career status in the legislation they passed in 2013. Some 56,000 teachers had been granted the status prior to the new law that offered multi-year contracts in exchange for tenure. Lawyers for the state contend the new law only modifies the status of teachers who've taught four years or more, but lawyers for NCAE said this pushed teachers back to probationary status. Perhaps one signal of how the court might rule came from Judge Linda Stevens, who asked the state, how in the world are we going to better attract better teachers when 
not only have they historically received extremely low salaries for being teachers in North Carolina, they've gotten no raises, and now they've got no career status option. Chris, it's always been hard to predict how an appellate court's going to rule, but many believe that the line of questioning and the tone of questioning from these three judges indicated that they questioned the elimination of tenure. What happens if the court says the law is unconstitutional? Well, then the law is unconstitutional and those teachers don't lose that. And I think it is hard to predict a lot of times what a court does, but this one seems uh, relatively easy to predict. Now, they may surprise us, but it does seem by th this panel, remember, this is one panel of the Court of Appeals. It still has a long way to go in the courts if the state does appeal it. Uh, but it is, uh, it does take teachers back to a, they can say they have a four-year contract, but they, they lose the due process rights that they have under the current tenure system. Uh, I think the Court of Appeals will rule in favor of the teachers, but I don't, I think this will continue up the courts. This will not be the last ruling in this case. All right, John, let's turn this over on the other side. Let's say that the court decides to uphold the law. Uh, is it possible that they could perhaps say, okay, we're going to uphold the law, but these people who already had career status are going to be allowed to continue it? Yes, well, I don't believe there's any dispute about the constitutionality of eliminating grants of tenure for teachers who are now being hired. So that's right. done, unless yeah. a future legislature right. changes it. So we really are only talking about two groups, teachers who already <coughs> have tenure and teachers who have been hired, assuming there Promise. will be tenure, and then that went has gone away. The, the, uh, the, I don't really know how this is going to turn out either, but there is a sort of an odd uh, contradiction in the case that the plaintiffs are making. They are saying tenure isn't really jo you know, a job for life, it's just due process rights. But then they say that there's an ownership interest that the state can't take away because the teachers already own. Well, they, you can't really own due process rights. So they really are making an argument that sounds a lot like tenure the way we usually understand it. So I think that if it gets to the state Supreme Court, I'm not sure that the appeals court decision, if it goes in favor of the plaintiffs, will stand. Rufus, while we're on this subject of teachers, we need to talk about, uh, the News and Observer ran a series last week uh, talking about longevity pay for teachers, which was eliminated during the, the pay raise uh, incident last uh, year, year the, the program that was passed in 2014. Uh, the News and Observer pointed out they did away with longevity for teachers. They didn't do away with longevity, particularly for their legislative staff or for other state employees. Uh, what does that say? You can, you can do categories and get by with it if you keep them all equal in the same category. But getting back to his uh, tenure, uh, in this case, in my opinion, is a vested right. If you don't believe that, ask Gene Boyce, who brought the suit for all the people with the pensions, and everybody said, well, you can take that away. Gene Boyce won three times in, in every court in, in the state of North Carolina. So I think it's not only tenure. Or I think it's a vested right they have, and that's a good but, argument. But back to my question, Becky, doesn't it just appear that this legislature is trying to punish teachers? No, I don't think that's it at all. Here's what I think this legislature is trying to do. I think they're trying to ensure that every classroom in North Carolina has a good teacher so that every child in North Carolina has an opportunity to have an excellent education. That's what this is about. It's ensuring that good teachers are in the classrooms in North Carolina. It's worth noting, by the way, that Judge Stevens' comment that you quoted earlier Earlier, is entirely inappropriate for a court of appeals judge. I assume she's not going to decide this case based on what she thinks. It sounded Teacher like some policy. of the comments you'd hear from the Supreme Court. I mean, it's perfectly fine for legislators to make the All argument right, see, that this is a bad policy. The judge should only be deciding whether it's constitutional, not whether it is advisable. While we discuss that, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Hi, I'm Linda Loveland. I want the best for my kids. Feeding them foods they like within my budget is a priority. But what do we really know about these foods? North Carolina farmers and food experts give you a website to find it all. FeedTheDialogueNC.com, a place where moms like you and me can learn more about the foods we eat and the farmers that feed us. Check it out. Add your input and help feed the dialogue. Let's talk food at FeedTheDialogueNC.com. Nobody ever imagined a mammogram machine being subject to CON law. I want to invest our business dollars into technology that I think is going to benefit my patients and customers. We should be able to do that. I think it's time to take a law that was intended to protect the citizens of North Carolina and now is harming them and change it. I'm Dr. Bruce Schroeder, 
and I support CON Reform. Visit ReformCONnow.com. How will North Carolina compete in a future where everything is accelerated? Join state leaders February 9th and 10th at the Raleigh Convention Center for the 30th Annual Emerging Issues Forum. Explore how innovators are thriving and how North Carolina can keep pace. Register now at emergingissues.org. Medicaid system is not a perfect system. Uh, there are things that could be changed, but we, there's a lot that's going well with these systems. Our community care of North Carolina is in place. It's a team of nurses, advisors, uh, caregivers who help us out. We want to call and, and say, look, I've got Miss so-and-so here. She needs to have her weight checked each day because she's got congestive heart failure. Can you send one of those monitors out to the house and keep an eye on this and let me know if her weight goes up too much because if it does, she's retaining fluid and she's going to be back in the hospital. We work together with them. That's a great system that saves a lot of money. It's proven to work. We're not opposed to changing the things that need to be changed, but let's not throw out everything that we worked for for the past 15 to 20 years. North Carolina's Family Physicians supports Medicaid reform that builds on our state's foundation of medical homes. OurNCHealthcare.com all right, let's ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Becky Gray, we'll start with you. One thing we haven't talked about tonight is the General Assembly going back into session. And what we've looked at new leaders, we've talked about a new Speaker of the House, talking about shining stars and where the rising stars are. I would argue that the rising stars in the General Assembly are going to be the women. Um, appointed to many of the powerful committees. 20 of the 26 women in the General Assembly have been appointed to either chairs or vice chairs. In the Senate, appropriations chair is a woman. The women are where it's going to be. John, tell us something we don't know. Speaking of the legislature, we all know that one of the issues to be debated this year is Governor McCrory's idea of a $1 billion infrastructure bond. Projects will be debated and so forth. What maybe people may not have expected is the type of bond is not going to be a big issue. Should it be a government, a traditional bond issued with a vote of the people, or should it be a certificate of participation issued without a vote of the people, a controversial topic? Chris, tell us something we don't know. Uh, President Obama came under fire this past week for floating the idea of ending the 529 college savings plan. It set off a big fireworks firestorm. The president withdrew that proposal, so now we still have a 529 savings plan. But left out of that debate, all the conservatives were criticizing him, including Virginia Fox, North Carolina Congresswoman. The North Carolina General Assembly last year ended the state deduction for off your state taxes for the 529. So when you fill out your taxes this year, you won't be able to deduct that from state taxes. Ruthless. Nobody's talking about Tell it. Tell us something we don't I know. I think the General Assembly will reconsider their abolition of the historic preservation tax credit. They should. It's brought in $1.6 billion in the, since existence. And I believe you'll see that restored. They will if Linda Edmiston has anything. Yes, if my wife has anything to do with it, they will. <laughs> well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. So stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback and read our weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. And we hope you'll join us next week when NC Spin will take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.